Hello, Betty. What's the problem? I haven't got a problem. I've got fucking problems. Plural. Wanna wear? Sure. This is Margaret Prescott, host of Sojourner Truth. This past Saturday marked the six-year anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster, the largest nuclear disaster in a quarter of a century, the worst since Chernobyl in 1986. The disaster took place on March 11, 2011. Northeastern Japan was hit by a massive earthquake, 9.0. Then a tsunami, destructive tsunami, followed wiping out towns one by one, and then in the aftermath, math, three reactors at the nuclear power station melted down. More than 15,000 people died, more than 6,000 were injured, and many more forced to flee their homes. Now, at the end of this month, the Japanese government is set to lift the evacuation orders on some of the areas surrounding uh, Fukushima. Now, since the disaster, there's been a lot of controversy around nuclear power plants. Uh, Germany uh, made a move to end its dependence on nuclear power. France, actually, and the U.S. Uh, increased um, dependence on nuclear power, or at least continue to build nuclear power. Uh, good news for residents of California, where the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant is due to close. The San Onofre power plant was shut down for good in 2013 as a result of faulty equipment that led to a small release of radioactive steam and a lot of protests leading uh, to the closure of San Onofre. Um, now, here to discuss all of this with us, I'd like to welcome back to Sojourner Truth, Kevin Camps. He is the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear, a leading U.S. anti-nuclear organization. He specializes in high-level waste management and transportation, new and existing reactors, climate change, and federal subsidies. Kevin, welcome back. Hi, Margaret. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Kevin, I think we actually caught up with you the day of uh, the, the disaster at uh, Fukushima now. Um, of course, for people living in Japan uh, who have to who may have to return to the area surrounding uh, Fukushima, they have uh, concerns. And I'd like to hear your view on uh, why they should be concerned. But also, people in the U.S. may not realize that the accident also had a reaction on the environment here in the United States. So why don't we start with that in terms of the reaction, um, the impact in the U.S.? Well, you know, the atmospheric releases during the first days and weeks of the Fukushima nuclear catastrophe had direct impacts on the United States. There were airborne uh, releases that traveled across the Pacific Ocean with the prevailing winds and then fell as rain or snow in North America. So one of the data points that, that really stuck in my head was radioactive rainwater in Boise, Idaho, in about mid-April mm. of 2011 that measured about 250 times the Safe Drinking Water Act levels for radioactive iodine-131, which is a particularly vicious radioactive poison, one of the worst actors at both Fukushima and Chernobyl, for example. And that was just radioactivity traveling with the winds and then falling down. And actually in the state of Virginia, just days into the nuclear catastrophe, there was a warning from the state to residents of Virginia, don't drink rainwater. If you collect rainwater for drinking in a cistern, don't drink it until further notice. So it was this hodgepodge response by state and federal government in the United States that was uh, very alarming, that they didn't even know how to handle it. And, uh, you know, the worst impacts, though, were close in in Japan. That's where the radioactivity was the worst. Right. And, and we'll be talking with uh, nuclear expert Arnie Gunderson, to us as part of our coverage of the anniversary, which happened this past Saturday of the accident. Now, there were also uh, reports of this cesium-134 
uh, which is referred to as a fingerprint of F Fukushima. I mean, you mentioned the, the drinking water, but also looking at an article from December of 2016 that seawater samples taken from uh, Tillamook Bay and Gold Beach in Oregon that is showing up there. And also it's been de detected in um, Canadian salmon. <laughs> so... Um, it yeah. continues beyond um, what we initially saw after the accident. That's another startling factoid about Fukushima is that uh, by a couple years ago, the plume of radioactivity in seawater had come all the way across the Pacific and to the point where a doubling of radioactive cesium, artificial cesium, radioactive cesium in seawater was detectable along the west coast of North America. So you take the other sources of artificial radioactivity in the Pacific from bomb test fallout that happened over the course of decades, uh, routine so-called releases of radioactivity from the nuclear power industry into the ocean. You take all that and Fukushima doubled it. So mm. that's another impact. And then you mentioned the fish. That's a real concern is the bio concentration of radioactive poison in the seafood supply and the top predator species are going to be the worst and then of course humans eat those so we knew as uh we found out on the first anniversary so that would have been march of 2012 that scientists had detected radioactive cesium in bluefin tuna uh as early as august of 2011 off the west coast of north america what had happened is as young tuna they were on the northeast coast of japan they had picked up contamination in their flesh and then faster than even the currents or diffusion would carry it, these fish brought it all the way to the west coast of North America by swimming there. So radioactivity gets around. It's not a very big planet when it comes to a nuclear accident. Yeah, so everybody out there eating sushi, you know, who knows um, what uh, contamination um, we're devouring here. Uh, now, before we uh, bring Arnie into, Arnie Gunderson into this discussion, Kevin, tell us your, uh, first of all, the reaction in the U.S. in the nuclear industry. What impact did Fukushima have in looking at nuclear power as a solution for energy in the United States, and also um, any concerns you have now with this new administration and uh, the EPA? Well, um, both in Japan and you mentioned Germany and even in the United States, Fukushima has had a huge impact on public perceptions and actions regarding nuclear power. So Arnie can speak more about it, but he played a key role, as did many folks, in the shutdown of uh, San Onofre in 2013. And then just last September, Diablo Canyon, uh, there was a deal hammered out between the company and environmental groups and labor unions and local communities to shut down Diablo Canyon instead of extending its license. That's not going to take place until 2024 or 2025. There's, you know, record-breaking shutdowns of atomic reactors in the United States, and mm -hmm. Arnie's had a major hand in a number of those. So Fukushima put nuclear power back on a lot of people's radar screens, that the safety risks are just not worth it. There are other sources of electricity that happen to be cleaner and cheaper and just as reliable, so why aren't we using them? And Germany is uh, leading the world in that regard. All right. Okay. So, um, Kevin, thank you for that. And uh, we're going to be continuing uh, to follow this. A lot of environmental uh, concerns. There's a march of scientists coming up in April, I believe, um, on Washington, D.C. And who knows uh, what we're going to be facing in, in the future. So we appreciate you joining us, Kevin Camps. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is Margaret Prescott, host of Sojourner Truth, and we are marking the six-year anniversary of the Fukushima uh, disaster, the largest nuclear disaster in a quarter of a century since Chernobyl. Chernobyl was uh, 1986. I'd like to welcome back to Sojourner Truth a man who really, in the, the period after Fukushima, was regularly on our show helping us to understand what is going on, Arnie Gunderson, um, 
nuclear power uh, expert, holds a nuclear safety uh, patent, was a licensed reactor operator, a former nuclear industry senior uh, vice president, and Arnie also managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants in the United States. And in February and March of last year, Arnie worked in Japan teaching scientists and citizen scientists how to collect accurate radiation uh, data and more. Arnie, welcome back. Hey, Margaret. Thank you for having me again. It's nice to hear your voice. Okay. So, Arnie, um, Kevin uh, talked about the key role that you have been playing since the accident. Of course, you played a key role uh, prior to the accident. Uh, Tell us uh, something about the work that you were doing in Japan itself. Um, well, first off, I'm, I'm trying to remove from my lexicon the, the word accident. You know, an accident is when an owl hits your windshield in the middle of the night and totally yeah. unforeseeable. A disaster uh, is one that is foreseeable, and, and that's what we really have in Fukushima. You know, when you build yeah. a when you build a 12 foot tsunami wall and you know that 50 foot tsunamis can occur, uh, that's not an accident. That's a disaster. When I was over there. It was amazing. The inhumanity of the Japanese government and Tokyo Electric to their own citizens. You know, my biggest takeaway is that radiation is everywhere. And I ran into doctors who were were deliberately and knowingly distorting the medical records of, of people. You know, I had a woman whose hair fell out. She had a bloody nose for two months. And she had splotches all over her body, and she she lived about three miles from the reactor. And her doctor wrote it up as stress. So you know, from as being a scientist, if I ever try to go back and find out, you know, what illnesses were caused by the uh, by the uh, disaster, um, it's very hard to find medical records that haven't been doctored by the doctors. We had one doctor who was actually put out of business because he refused to do that. He put radiation on their um, uh, on the medical forms, and, and the government refused to reimburse him for his services. Mm. So the, the epidemiological record is being totally misconstrued by the nuclear industry, um, to, uh, and it's very difficult now as a scientist to go back and, and try to recreate what actually happened. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, of course, the several hundred people plan to move back as soon as April to the um, area surrounding Fukushima. But 53 percent of former residents, according to a government poll taken last fall, they don't want to return. And a lot of people are afraid uh, to return. Um, Should they be? Oh, absolutely. You know, they're, they're in a situation where they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. Mm. What's happening is the people that moved out are having their stipends withdrawn unless they move home. So, uh, you know, they, they can't live away because they're losing money, and the only way to retain that income is to move back into a contaminated zone. What I found, I took hundreds of samples, and uh, we're working on a scientific paper, and it takes time, but... Um, Radiation's everywhere. I found it at, you know, I went into convenience store, 7 Elevens, and, and the, the, the floor mat, I would sample the floor mat, and it's loaded with radioactivity. This is in areas where people live. I even found radiation in Tokyo, significant radiation. I mean, if it was in the United States, it would have to go to a radioactive waste dump. Mm. And this was in the flower pot right outside of Japan's Atomic Energy Commission. They're, they're, they call it METI. Um, and here we are, we're going to have the Olympics in 2020, and the whole country is, uh, is contaminated. It, it, it's serious, and, uh, but cancers don't start until about 10 years out. So everybody can ignore the problem, with the exception of thyroid. There's been a, a noticeably, statistically meaningful increase in thyroid cancers, um, which happened very quickly. But all the other cancers are years out, and so... Uh, you know, don't worry. Be happy. They're gonna they're gonna try to get more plants online, and then mask the uh, the health effects by 
distorting the records. Yeah, and, you know, just remarkable. I mean, looking at some of the data at the site, 400 tons of contaminated water created every day. Um, the process of decontaminating that water, creating more than 3,500 containers of radioactive sludge um, and and more. But according, and that's according to the New York Times. But also, Arnie, have you heard this story recently about populations of wild animals, including radioactive wild boars, booming in the area around Fukushima? Well, the, the population is, uh, is growing uh, because uh, there's no natural predators. Mm. Um, it's interesting. One of the uh, hunters gave me some wild boar meat while I was over there, and I put my Geiger counter on it, and oh my God, it was highly contaminated. Uh, so um, th- these these and I also chased radioactive monkeys through the forests and measured their poop and I walked out on fields where there were cattle and 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 measured the cow plop and stuff like that. That it's in the intestinal tracts, it's in the the meat and the organs of all these animals. And uh, Tim Mousseau, Dr. Tim Mousseau, is already finding uh, abnormalities in some of the animals that reproduce quickly. Um, you know, mm. birds and uh, birds and insects and things like that. You know, Arnie. You know, when something huge happens and and the, the people's uh, attention and the news uh, focuses on it uh, for some time. I mean, with this six year anniversary, I really didn't see a, a whole heck of a lot of of coverage. But um, we still have to be concerned about the possibility of nuclear accidents. I mean, I'm looking at an article um, actually from today about Kentucky. I mean, with um, that in coal country, um, they are on the cusp of opening the door to nuclear power. Um, as uh, and, and, you know, the argument could be made of uh, stopping the reliance on fossil fuel and people seeing nuclear power as some kind of clean alternative. But back, you know, uh, in, in Kentucky, they had a horrible situation with storing uh, toxic waste. I think it was back in the 1960s and uh, 1970s where 800 corporations dumped millions of cubic feet um, of radioactive waste at a site, nuclear reactor was never built. But what are your concerns now, uh, as this debate continues, about nuclear power as an alternative, a, a, a kind of a, as ironic as it might sound, clean energy? Arnie Gunderson. Yeah, that's a great question. There's two pieces to that. First is there's 99 operating nuclear reactors, and um, uh, we're kidding ourselves if we think an accident can't happen here. Mm. Uh, we can have a disaster just like Fukushima Daiichi. As a matter of fact, 24 of these reactors in the United States are identical to the Daiichi reactor. So um, to think that the, just because these plants have run for 30 years doesn't mean that tomorrow might not be a bad day um, is, uh, is is really wishful thinking. But the new reactors are so expensive that they make no sense. We did a, a, a two-minute animation on the on the Fairwinds site, and if your if your listeners would like to go up Fairwinds F A I R E W I N D S and look up smoke screen, we talk exactly about what you're talking about. The the um, cost to build a nuclear plant and the enormous time to build a nuclear plant actually makes global warming worse, and the reason is that <clears throat> that that money could be better spent quicker. And more, um, you could build more of it, uh, solar or windmills or energy efficiency. So we'd be better spent instead of building a new generation of nukes for ten trillion dollars that would only solve about ten percent of the problem and take fifty years to build. Instead of investing that ten trillion in a fifty-year project, you can you can build windmills and solar collectors right now to begin to bend the curve. Economists call it the um, uh, opportunity costs. If you're going to spend money on one thing, that money is then tied up and you can't spend it on something else. 
Yeah, and finally, um, you know, you just have a minute or so, Arnie, but you mentioned um, the climate, the warming of, of the climate. I mean, we now have an EPA and somebody in the EPA who is a, a climate um, warming denier. Um, what are your concerns now uh, moving forward as, uh, you know, we still hope um, for wind and solar and, and clean energy, but uh, a lot of people are very, very worried about what the future might look like, Arnie Gunderson. Yeah, you know, across the board, especially at the EPA, but across the board, uh, we're seeing a war on truth and a war on fact and a war on science. And, um, you know, truth and facts and science say that global warming is happening. And truth and facts and science uh, uh, would also support a whole bunch of other arguments, too. Um, but the EPA is uh, ignoring truth and fact and science uh, to pursue a political agenda. Right. Well, Arnie, quickly give your website so people can get information. And all the best to Margaret. Oh, I know she uh, works closely you. with yeah, you. <laughs> so the website is Fairwinds, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S dot org. And uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. And uh, um, there's lots of great stuff on the site. Well, Arnie, come back soon. Thank you for joining us.